ይሶበ ኑ ብለ ወዓዲ ትኮልስ ኒ ያን ሙሊ ሀባ ማብሎ ኒ ማሪጋ ማሐነ ካለ ሀብና ማርኮ ተሐብና ካኪና ከበለ ኮን ሄካኪና ወራደ ኮን ሄካኪና ማሐካኪና ግዲ አክተ ማሐነ ሊ ለዋዲ ኢትዮጵያ ኢትና ይዒጀ ፍሪክ መጋላ ለዒሽ አፈርክ ሊ ሚ ወራዳል ወክላ ቦቲ አከንቂ ሃይ ማራथन ራና ኤክስትሮርዲነ is about to embark on a remarkable journey using his own dna as the road map i've always been fascinated by genetics and the fact that it can bring my history right here it's like magic locked within each of us is a genetic history book it reveals not only our deep ancestry but also the journey of mankind across the globe this is it the birthplace of the exodus the first exodus Recent breakthroughs in genetics will allow Eddie to use his own DNA to unlock the secrets of where he and we came from. Instead of going back to the last couple of hundred years, we're going to go back to the last couple of hundred thousand years. This is the epic story of humanity's journey from our shared origins in Africa 10,000 generations ago all the way to Eddie Izzard. This is the first time in Britain that an individual has looked at their own DNA and used that to retrace their ancestral journey. My ancestors came across here. And finally, he'll bridge the gap between his genetic and family history. I believe we are related to each other. Oh, it's Eddie Izzard. Fancy that. Eddie Izzard is about to become the first person in Britain to use his own DNA to retrace his ancestors' journey across thousands of miles and 200,000 years from the very first modern human in Africa to Eddie. He's beginning by donating some saliva to science. God, I think I've done it. One spit. It seems like an unpromising start to an exploration of deep ancestry. Science in action. This is Blue Peter. But Eddie's spit contains DNA. DNA is found within our cells. It's the instruction manual that helps build and run our bodies. Scientists have also found another remarkable use for it. Locked within our DNA is a genetic route map that reveals how our ancestors migrated out of Africa and went on to populate the rest of the world. It's the tool Eddie will use to help him retrace the human journey. While Eddie waits for the initial DNA results, he's going back to his childhood home to visit his dad, John. He's the inspiration for Eddie's quest. Crazy dogs. Hello. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Hi. Hey. Nice to see you. <laughs> He's 83 now. I kind of thought right. one can't live forever, but it's it's nice to give him something before any bad thing happens. Are you intrigued by this? I think it's going to be intriguing. Yes. Anything that tells uh, tells us a bit more about ancient history, uh, something that I never dreamt of doing yeah. before. Yeah. Eddie will undertake two journeys. One will explore his dad's lineage, but first he'll explore his mum's line. And this journey will be close to his heart. His mum died of cancer when Eddie was a young boy. It'd be interesting to find out if something comes out of mum's side they go, "Oh, yes, that that resonates with me because I can't I can't see it so clearly because mother isn't here. My mother died when I was 6." one of the things she said to me before she died was she wouldn't have the pleasure of seeing you grow up yeah well whatever we find will be fascinating this is the first time apparently anyone's done it apart from scientists checking other people this is the first time anyone's gone on this 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 journey i think they've done it with animals 
But the animals are not good chatters on television. Well, they don't say a lot, no. Not, <laughs> not that we can make out, anyway. As part of his journey, Eddie will also discover where traits like his blue eyes came from. But it's not just what makes us unique individuals that excites him. I look for connections. That's why I do gigs in French, and I'm going to do them in German and, and Russian and Spanish, just so to find connections around the world. We're all the same. Here's my dad now with dogs. He's walked out that door many times. So it's connections. That's what I'm looking for. Eddie has come to the genetics lab to find out the results of his DNA test. Geneticist Dr. Jim Wilson is using the latest advances in genetic science to unlock the secrets of where Eddie's mother and father lines came from. We took your spit and we extracted your DNA from your spit using a chemical reaction. And then we focused in on two pieces of DNA, a piece of DNA called the Y chromosome, your father's 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 father, all the way back through the generations. But we're also going to look at your mother line all the way back through the ages. Right. So how will Jim use Eddie's DNA to first explore his mum's deep ancestry? The answer lies in genetic changes known as markers. DNA is passed from generation to generation as an almost exact copy. But occasionally, DNA changes. These changes, the markers, can indicate the start of another branch in the human family tree. And it's these markers that Jim will focus on. He looks for matches to Eddie's markers in people from around the world. He'll access databases of hundreds of thousands of individuals. They, like Eddie, have given their saliva for DNA testing over the last decade or so. Many traditional communities have remained in the same place for thousands of years. So a match with an Eddie marker can show where his ancestors traveled on their migration route. So what we're going to do is to take you to relive the journey that your female line ancestors made from that origin in Africa as they moved out of that continent and moved around eventually all the way to England. And how we're going to do this is to try to introduce you to genetic cousins of yours at each point. Each branch of the human family tree originating from a new marker is known by a letter. The root of these branches, L, takes every one of us back to Africa, to one woman. All modern humans originate from her. Everyone in the world, wherever they lived, was descended from one woman, and she lived in Africa, and so they called her Eve. I have heard of her, but her name was probably more Gladys or Janine. So basically, everyone in the world is related. Yeah, so what... Um, that, that yes needs to be bigger than that. Because <laughs> the, there's racists out there going, I am so different, I will kill you for the differences. And hang on, everyone's related, yeah? Yeah, it's an amazing uh, discovery to see that all humans everywhere all go back to a small group of people actually in Africa. So where do we go first? You're going to go to southern Africa, to okay. Namibia, to the Kalahari Desert or its outskirts to wow. meet some of the San people. They're the first branch of the human family tree. The point at which they connect into your line is 192,000 years ago, we estimate. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Uh, great. Uh, wow. This is the start of Eddie's unique experiment in genetic time travel, taking him back 10,000 generations to meet his and our most distant ancestral cousins. To get there, he has to travel more than 10,500 kilometers to the edge of the Kalahari Desert. This arid bushland is a tough environment and would have been for our ancestors. The sand bushmen who live here are one of the last remaining peoples to preserve the hunter-gatherer way of life our ancestors practiced almost 200,000 years ago. Wow. 
nice man. Just how I remember it. Wow. It's time for Eddie to meet his and our most distant relatives. He wants to experience what life might have been like for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Local bushman, San Max Kike, a ranger with the Namibian Park Service, will be his guide. So, so, uh, and the hats are crazy, I like that. Crazy hat. Uh, Debe. Debe? Debe. When you get back 10,000 mums, it's such a long line of people that also put their genetics into what ended up as mum that you can't just say, that woman looks like mum, but it's still intriguing. Let's go. Hunting gets all the plaudits, but then, as now, gathering would have made up the vast majority of the diet. Eddie's first task is to gather tubers, roots that retain water. Their plant stems are easy to identify, but the tubers themselves lie deep underground. So just down there, yeah? Just down there. The bushmen often use the tubers to quench their thirst and even cook them like potatoes. How far down do I go? How do I know when I've got to reach gold? I don't know where I'm going now, so that I'm... I'm going to the supermarket, seems a lot easier. I see there's a whole string of them. Yeah, now you can pull it out. Okay. Thank you. Good job. That's gathering. Nail's still intact. <laughs> Eddie's painted nails, the only outward sign of his cross dressing, have set tongues wagging. She was saying that uh, seeing you having painting on your nails is like you want to become a woman. I know what that is, part of what's in me. I have girl and boy in me. Eddie promises the ladies a manicure before he leaves. But do you have do the you paint with you? I do, actually. The next food source is less taxing on the nails. Collecting berries from the false Mopani tree. I agree with them. They're all saying, hey, what the fuck, man? Now I'm looking for berries. Now I'm on a quest. Two berries. Three berries. I'm beginning to feel at home with my new relatives. This, this doesn't feel alien at all. So 10,000 mums ago, my 10,000th mum was doing this with, uh, with women like these women here. They're happy that you are here. And they're not pissed off? They'll be in a bit. <laughs> Hunting and gathering has been the predominant way of life for the vast majority of human history. And for the first 100,000 years or so of our existence, we practiced it solely in Africa. Wow. That was nice, honey. This is pollen. I think I'll put pollen on my list. A bag of pollen, please. And some of the lady. James Bond. One of our greatest allies in this hostile environment was fire. It didn't just keep us warm and allow us to eat more nutritious food. 
It also protected us from our animal enemies. Eddie's newly found relatives teach him how the Izards made fire before the invention of the safety match. I always wanted to be able to make fire. It's one of those things on my list, making fire. I thought it would take me, like, a couple of weeks of training, but once they give you the right sticks and you work out what to do, it's such an amazing thing. Blow, blow, blow. Yeah, 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 yeah. My God, my first fire. Wow. This is made my first fire. Ah. He was looking at your nails and said, it looks like a, a flag of, of a country. Oh, yeah, that is. This is my country. This is my continent. When you look at your nails, it's like that only with ladies, but not yeah. with men. So, I know. Crazy, but a good crazy. I got to call him with a That works. You see, sense of humor. A joke to a family I'm related to 192,000 years ago. So we are all related. Yeah. So they are glad that we are related and we are together now. Now that Eddie has learned how to make fire, all he has to do is keep it going. With Sand, he wants to experience how his ancestors survived the night. He'll have only fire to protect him from the predators and elephants that visit the water hole close by. Holy cow. You heard that? That was, that is, it sounded a bit like a lion, but that is a, an elephant. Yeah, that's an elephant. Uh, just uh, drinking or coughing? He's making a lot of noise. Elephants are herbivores. Unless you look like an enormous salad. <laughs> You're dressed as a salad. They're not going to go for you. But they will squash your head and get you under their big paw. This is what 10,000th mum, I'm calling Shirley now, must have done, she must have sat out around the fire. It's so black out there, so dark. Obviously, you've got to keep this fire going. That is your safety. Don't go anywhere. Do not venture out beyond this flame. The fire looked a little worryingly low, but so if we keep waking up and putting the uh, things on the fire, there's, there's just still enough wood to keep us going till sun up. Can't hear animals, can't hear elephants. The Mayan plays tricks. The following morning, Eddie hasn't been carried off by hungry herbivores. It was quite a night. I didn't think at all about my ancestors. I was thinking about me trying to survive the night. I was a little bit anxious because I thought we might die if some predator had come. Sarn knew what to do, but I didn't know. What if they got some? <laughs> this is an idea. Okay, they've got some. What do I do? Now, don't be pathetic and run off. You've got to do something in the hell. I, I kept that stick near me. I thought poke things with sticks. I had these backup, pathetic backup plans of how to deal with whatever. It's almost time for Eddie to begin the next leg of his genetic journey. But not before he fulfills his promise to the ladies. The people here, they, they don't seem that far away. I thought it would feel very far away. Hi, 
It was great to be here and have met these people and to get a little thumbnail sense of what gathering is like. I have made fire. The next leg of Eddie's DNA time traveling will take him forward 140,000 years to some time before 60,000 years ago. By then, modern humans had colonized the enormous continent of Africa in search of more hospitable places to live. This, despite an estimated total population of no more than 20,000 people. Scientists have DNA tested traditional communities and with the results have created a map to show how humans migrated across the world. Dr. Jim Wilson is now using this information to discover where Eddie's maternal line traveled. Eddie's next key marker gave birth to the L3 branch. And this is seen today particularly in East Africa along the shores of the Red Sea. About 40% or more of the people there today share this marker with Eddie. So it seems like his ancestors must have moved through this region at some point in the past. But what's really interesting is the next marker after that, um, which produced the N branch. This is not really seen in Africa today. It actually arose in Arabia. So we think this points to the place where modern humans first left Africa at some point before 60,000 years ago. Eddie's traveling 5,000 kilometers across the continent to the small country of Djibouti. He wants to reach the place where modern humans probably first left Africa, a narrowing of the Red Sea, known as the Bab el Mandeb Strait. The route passes through some of Africa's harshest terrain. At 157 meters below sea level, Lake Asal is the lowest place in Africa. It is also saltier than the Dead Sea. Anyway, they, they dig up salt from here, so there are people who live here and work here. I prefer to be in Croydon. And I was feeling car sick, and then fear goes into this, and then... So anyway, I don't want to be here. If you lived here, you'd go, this is, this is Mordor. And then after that, you'd go, Mordor, my kind of town. If you don't know Mordor, it's, of course, the Lord of the Rings place where um, Mr. Bad Guy lives, the guy with the one big eye. Just think, imagine your way back. If you heard that, you would think that was for God's being angry or having a bad tummy. Probably a lot of guys have said, this is how God's angry. They're angry with you, Steve. But anyway, we're probably going to get hit by that. Despite his fear of getting fried by the gods, Eddie's determined to press on. Many of the inhabitants of this coastline share the genetic marker that suggests our ancestors passed through here. There's evidence these early modern humans were, for the first time, exploiting the marine environment. Deposits of shellfish from an archaeological site show they were harvesting the fruits of the sea. But Eddie's quest to reach the place the Izards left Africa may have been thwarted. We're in a dust storm, and so if you're going at 15 kilometers an hour, you just can't see anything. So we don't know what we're going to hit, so we will stop for a while. Have sandwiches. Sing song. King gang. The 
It's a reminder of how resilient early modern humans must have been in order to survive. It's really tough. It's a tough land. It's a tough fight now. It would have been a tough fight then. We're not sure what the conditions were back then, but it really is tough. Nicola, who was driving us, decided to continue. He feels happy that driving into the sand. We've got military people with us with guns, so we can shoot invisible sand monsters that come. After two hours, Eddie emerges from the sandstorm at his destination, the Bab el Mandeb Strait. He's just 35 kilometers from the Arabian country of Yemen, where it's thought modern humans first stepped outside Africa. Bizarrely, the Yemen is also where Eddie himself was born. Today, on the African side of the Bab el Mandeb Strait, fishing is still as important as it was to our ancestors. To explore what life might have been like around 60,000 years ago, Eddie is off to help catch some fish, accompanied by his translator, Fatima. They are meeting Nouria Ahmed Suli. She is one of just three fisherwomen in the whole of Djibouti. Nouria, who is from Djibouti, an Afar woman, which is very close to the Yemeni people. Uh, Yemen is just over there. And she's the captain. You can see it in her face that she's a, a can-do woman. So how long has she been a fisherwoman? 20 years. 20 years? Mm -hmm. And what was she doing before? I have faced so many problems. I became a fisherwoman. All right. I married, and I was happy with my family, with my children, at my home. The war happened in Obo, as a civil war. Uh, then, uh, so civil war happened, uh, and after that she became a fisherman? Yes. Where does she sell the fish that she catches? Only in Yemen? Yes. Yeah. 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 Here, you know, they pay 250 there, they pay 1,000 francs. Okay, so four times as much for the fish. Yes. And when she goes to Yemen, does she go over Bab 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 That is the route you take? She goes in this boat, she yes. goes to Yemen. Yes. Does she speak Arabic? Somali. I speak Arabic well. I speak Somali also. All I can say is, it's me, Eddie. Wanted to fi Aden fi el Yemen. Just it's me Eddie wanted to fi Aden. Come shala. How many fish do you think here? More than a hundred. More than a hundred fish. Yalla yalla yalla. You've got to get the fish out of the nets, which is really tricky. And not break the nets. Where do we throw it? Every day, Noria follows the same route our ancestors probably took when they left Africa. The Bab el Mandeb is still a highway to Arabia. No one knows for sure why modern humans left Africa. But our innate curiosity and environmental change may have been two important factors. It's thought global cooling, an ice age, meant sea levels were lower at this time. Perhaps the shorter distance made the crossing more attractive. Some scientists believe only a handful of people made the initial crossing. Remarkably, it's thought that only two women gave birth to the rest of humanity outside Africa. One maternal line reached Australia, but Eddie's took a different route and headed towards Europe. That's the journey that humanity took 60 to 70,000 years ago. Maybe as few as 200 people, maybe only two women. My mother's line, which is not only my line, it's everyone's line who became European. So we all have problems whether we're British or whether we're European or British European, as I consider myself. But in fact, we're all coming from one mother who came across here and gave birth to nearly everyone in Europe.
Political unrest has prevented Eddie from making the crossing to the Yemen. Frustratingly, he can't follow directly in the footsteps of modern humans as they ventured outside Africa or visit his own birthplace. My dad and my mum met there, so it's very important to us. Mum working as a nurse for BP oil refining, dad as an accountant, and so it means a lot. My brother was born there, I was born there. My mum died six years later, so, and I have, we have these cine film memories of, of mum and dad there. It's in here, and bizarrely just happens to be the place where the exodus of humanity went through. This is it, the birthplace of the exodus, the first exodus. It's time for Eddie to leave his and our shared African roots behind. This is now the story of those of us who spread out across the rest of the world. Jim Wilson has been investigating where Eddie's female ancestors went after this momentous moment in human history. It means jumping forward another 42,000 years. Eddie's next significant marker, which gave birth to the T2 branch, originated about 18,000 years ago. Today, it's most common in populations in the Middle East and Turkey. So it seems that Eddie's ancestors are likely to have moved north, probably following uh, the Fertile Crescent, which runs from the Persian Gulf up to Turkey. And it seems like they were still there for one of the most significant turning points in human history, the birth of agriculture about 10 and a half thousand years ago. Farming meant an abundance of new foods and a more settled lifestyle. In a way, it is the birth of civilization. And it's here that something very interesting happened to Eddie's and many of our ancestors' genes. The next step in your mother line journey is to go to Turkey. And you're going to learn more there about how agriculture took hold. And you're also going to learn where your blue eyes came from. Where my blue eyes came from? That is very interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Jim. That'd be good to go to Turkey. My parents went on honeymoon to Turkey, to Istanbul. To explore his ancestors' roots in agriculture, Eddie's traveling to Turkey's Black Sea coast. Turkey has some of the earliest archaeological evidence for the domestication of cattle and sheep. This area is still known for dairy farming. Some other people here share Eddie's marker. Eddie's meeting farmer Fatima Teskan and her family, who are carrying on the tradition. So do I need to hold? Yeah, maybe like... Uh, Local guide, Boket Sahin, joins Eddie to translate. And how often do they milk the goats? Every morning. Uh, do you make cheese from this milk? She makes her own homemade yogurt, homemade butter. Right. All different kind of cheeses. All right, from, from the goat's milk? Yes. Milk is especially useful for Fatima's family. Her son had a tumor in his brain. She thinks goat milk is much healthier, especially for children with diseases. Right. The domestication of animals gave humans a valuable new food source from dairy products. But there was a hitch. Adults in many early agricultural communities were intolerant to milk. Genetics came to the rescue. What exactly is, is this, Fatima? Iran. And what, what is it made of? Goat milk, yogurt, water and salt. Here you go, so I'll just have a bit of this. Eddie and most Europeans can digest milk due to a genetic change that occurred around this time. It means we can process dairy products beyond infancy, whereas many people in the rest of the world can't. So I can taste yogurt in there. It's really nice and fresh and has a salty aftertaste. So thank you. When I was a teenager, I used to drink a liter a day. I used to neck it. I loved milk. I still do. And I thought it was at some point, am I becoming chalk boy, the calcium kid, you know. This ability to digest milk wasn't the only genetic change that occurred to Eddie's family around this time. You have blue eyes, I have blue eyes. Do other people in your family have blue eyes? Her father 
all her uh, siblings, and both of her children has right, blue eyes. Yeah, cool. Eddie's guide, Buquette, discusses the most up-to-date theory on the remarkable origin of blue eyes. The recent study by a team of genetic researchers in Copenhagen University. Okay. Everyone with blue eyes can be traced back to Black Sea coast 10,000 years ago. Everyone with blue eyes can be traced back to Black Sea? Yes. Wow. It was a single person. That's very curious. Blue eyes originating in one person isn't the only surprise. Both parents need to give blue-eyed genes to their offspring. So given that even today most of us are brown-eyed, the trait shouldn't survive at all. Why doesn't it die out? One of the most popular theory is that it is very attractive. And when there was a shortage of men, as they were hunters at that time, women with blue eyes were more desirable. So it's the select sexual selection, and it's very attractive, like gorgeous eyes you have. <laughs> yeah. I always miss eye colors. Do you notice eye colors, though? Women tend to notice eye colors better than men. Well, I do. I mean, even if you look at the Hollywood, the legendary people like Sinatra, Elvis, you know, Paul Newman. So blue eyes, which only turned up about 10,000 years ago, roughly, it could have just touched around by sexual attraction, people saying, hey, let's shag the, the man or woman with the blue eyes and have babies. For whatever reason, Blue eyes have persisted. They're doing the rounds. So where did the milk drinking Izards take their blue eyes next? Their adventure in agriculture led to Europe. The most likely place they entered the continent was the Bosphorus Straits, where Asia and Europe are separated by just a narrow stretch of water. A million and a half people still make this crossing every day. My ancestors came across here, maybe Hawaii 5 style, maybe with sails, I think sails would be out about then, and it was right here. On the European side of the Bosphorus, Eddie can't resist staying in the hotel where his parents honeymoon. Tuba Attis is a manager at the hotel. I'm really happy to accommodate you here. Okay. This is the previous D1 here, and your family stayed here 904. Oh, really? Yes, of course. How do you know course, this? Of course, we searched the... Uh, the, the records? Yes, oh, the wow. records, yes. This is the same room you're staying. This is in the same room? Yes. Can I take these pictures back to of my course. dad after we're talking about this? Of course, of course, of course, this is for okay. you. Wow. <laughs> I'm in room 904. I don't know if you remember the room you were in, but apparently it was this one. Yeah, that's to get the view. We had a good view of the Bosphorus. I've got a bit of a view of the Bosphorus, but unfortunately the Hyatt Hotel has come along and built a bloody great big hotel in the way of the Bosphorus. Yeah. Also, Mum's actual heritage comes through Istanbul, where you were on really? home. Yeah, so that's kind of just another irony. All right, Dad. You keep him well. Yeah, keep him well. We were all kind of knackered. All right, mate. Good Thanks to. for the call. No problem. Talk to you soon. Bye now. Bye. Around seven and a half thousand years ago, Eddie's mum's line probably moved into Europe as part of the agricultural revolution. The spread of farming into Europe is a bit like the scramble for land in the Wild West. You have to imagine with something around eight million people in the world at the time, many of them in the Middle East, that there was a continuous pressure for new land for agriculture. It looks like there were two main migration routes into the continent. One into central Europe following the main river valleys and another hugging the Mediterranean shore of southern Europe. Eddie's direct lineage headed northwest into the heart of the continent. But before he explores where they went, he's first going to check out what happened to some ancestral cousins who entered Europe along its southern fringes. Over the next 5,000 years, they settled in some very interesting places. Hello? Dr. Jim, where am I off to next? You're going to Pompeii. Pompeii? Pompeii in some way 
is representative of the next stage where great civilizations are developing and of course they're all entirely based on agriculture. So we're going there at a time that's before it blew up. Just around oh. 79 AD, I think. Oh, around 79, oh, right, okay. We're going there Tuesday before explosion. Yeah, exactly. Right. Bye. Pompeii will be exciting. I've been intrigued to see Pompeii for years. I think I'm quite good at imagining what it would be like to be there as a Roman. That will be fascinating. By 79 AD, Pompeii was a flourishing Roman town in southern Italy with a population of 20,000 people. But its residents were unaware that they were sitting on an active volcano. Here, Eddie won't be hanging out with modern-day descendants of his ancestors. He'll be meeting genetic cousins who died nearly 2,000 years ago. His guide is anatomist Professor Machi Hennenberg. Before Eddie meets his long-dead relatives, Machi wants to show him one of the delights of lost Pompeii. So, shagging. This is a house of sex? Yes. So people came here for entertainment. Okay. And uh, they had paintings showing what is happening here. This was uh, done on stone. A story stone. Yeah. Yes, well, they're showing various sexual positions, which is fairly similar to what one can see on the Internet today. Yes. Actually, and they're showing some curiosities, like people with double pennies, for example. Oh, really? Is that a medical thing? I don't know how to Yes, it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm an anatomist. I study anatomical variations. Okay. And Take actually, me. both double vagina and double pennies happen. Oh. Okay. That sounds crazy. And the beds are telling us how small people were. All right. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> it shows that people were, on average, about 100 millimeters, 10 centimeters shorter than we are today. Then there is a toilet. Romans were much more open about the toilets. Mm. For example, they had communal toilets. A lot of people actually sat here, right here. In this very space, doing a poo, having a chat, and saying, just having a poo, and I'll be right back in for number four, a bit of number four, and a bit of that old uh, number two, a bit of two and two, a bit of four. And food is across the road. I'll have a poo, we'll have some sex, and then we'll go and get a McDonald's. Eddie has come to Pompey's laboratory to meet some of his relatives. They couldn't give a spit sample, so their ancient DNA was extracted from their teeth. This fellow is your genetic cousin. Sadly, he was born with a congenital problem, so he had this tilted head, which is called torticollis. Torticollis. A nerve to his neck muscles was damaged because somebody helping the baby to be born pulled his head too much. And therefore, we both share something with him. Because you share his genes, right. and I shared his condition. Oh, really? Because until I was 12, I looked like this. So otherwise, he was quite a handsome fellow, as most people sharing your genes are. So. This is what I heard? Yes. <laughs> Eddie's genetic cousin died in 79 AD, when a volcanic eruption overwhelmed Pompeii. I mean, logically, people were leaving. Why did this family stay? Uh, I think we discovered why. And here's the answer. All right, let me go. And she's also your cousin, a young woman, about 17 years of age. She was 17? She was 17 at the moment of her death. And she carried a baby in her right. belly, and the baby was just about to be born. It was the last month of pregnancy. So the family says, we have to stay with you. And she was huddled in a corner of the room, protecting her baby, holding a bunch of coins to her breast, 
wearing heavy jewelry that stained her bones, the shoulder blades, the forearm bones, and her head is stained too, so she had some kind of a headdress. Okay, this is all kind of fascinating and tragic at the same time. Thirteen members of the same extended family died together. Eddie wants to visit the place where it happened. This is huge. The house belonged to Caius Julius Polybius, a former slave and successful politician. They were lying here in this room, the old man on the floor, and next to him a teenage boy, and the boy was holding father's hand. They must have been already afraid, and at the feet of the teenage boy, a younger boy, a few years old. And eventually they were covered by more and more of the ash. And this is the other room where the rest of the family died. Here was the 17-year-old young woman covered in her finery and with the baby in her belly. That's where she eventually died. Not a great way to go. They found about 20 centimeters of ash in the rooms, which would have blown in. So if you think about how snow works, it must have been, the ash must have been about here. You must have been wading through the ash. So they were trying to hold on to things. A baby was going to be born, and then they died. Eddie's journey has already covered nearly 200,000 years of human history. The landscape of towns, streets and houses, of civilization, is becoming much more familiar. I, I feel like I've been taken inside a real Latin Roman life, and that links to my mother's line. And just touching the walls is really close. Eddie's genetic cousin settled in southern Europe, but his direct ancestors appear to have followed a more northerly route through central Europe on their migration to Britain. Eddie's next key marker shows that this direct maternal line had, by the time of the Pompeii eruption, moved into northern Europe. We're getting to a really exciting stage of the genetic journey. As we get closer in space and time to Eddie's family in Britain, we can be more specific about the ancestral journey. This is because the more recent markers are shared by fewer people. Of the 69 markers in Eddie's maternal line DNA, this next one is the 67th. This means that we're looking for living people who share an ancestor with Eddie less than 100 generations ago. We found um, another marker that seems to originate much further north. This marker is only about 2,000 years old. And the really interesting thing is that this group seems to be focused in Scandinavia. Your mother's, mother's, mother's people were Vikings. Oh. What you're going to do now is meet people who are directly related to you in Denmark. Eddie has come to the ancient Viking capital and port of Roskilde. He is meeting Lars London and his sister Anne Pers Dottir. Lars recently gave a saliva sample to science. Jim then found him on the database, one of only ten matches. Okay. Well, cheers. Cheers. He and his sister share a direct maternal ancestor with Eddie from around 2,000 years ago. That's less than 70 generations. We share a mother from mother, 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 mother. Yes. Mother. Are there similarities between us? Yes. Which would be interesting. Football, I love football, yeah. mathematics. So I did math up to university level, but then didn't get it. Oh, you mathematics. That's <laughs> last. I, I also studied math. I, I took a PhD in applied math and, and did a postdoc uh, afterwards, two years. 
I ran 43 marathons you, in, a, 43? in a 43? in 51 days, uh, about oh, three years yeah. ago. So we, we, we ran a marathon uh, together. Yeah. I did in a, to a total of uh, 13 marathons, but over a time of 15 years. Which is an impressive record, and I apologize for coming with 43 and counting. <laughs> <it. laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I think because I have my father's name, Izzard is my father's name, half your genetics is your mother's side. Mm -hmm. So you tend to slightly ignore the mother's side and say, oh, what, what did the Izzards do down yeah. the line? Yes, I don't know that much about mum's side. And to find that I have a Viking link going through my mother, that is fascinating. The closest Eddie can get to his mum's Viking roots is to put himself in the place of his newly found ancestors. As they prepared to lay waste to a swathe of Britain. Perfect. From 793 AD, the Vikings began to raid Britain. Their secret weapon was the longship. Its shallow keel meant they didn't need harbors. They could row onto the shore. Not too fast. A little bit, yeah, like that, and then more power in each rope. Rowing is exhausting, so the Vikings used sail power when they could. What we do is we use our weight. Yep. So we go forward, and then we pull backwards like yeah. that, and then you fall onto me. Okay. And then when we're down, yeah. you push it towards the hole so she can take back the slack. I understand. Okay. Okay. And pull. Ah. Oh, that too much. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> we will just, just go. Don't, don't I fall on you? No, not yet. Just okay. sit down, down there hand hand and push it. And one more time. Careful, you might handle it. We need to get up. Oh, do me. Let's yes. Go, let's go back. Okay. How many hours would it take? To England? With the right wind, yeah. it would take them about three days. Eddie takes over the controls. Turn the ship slowly. Just do hand You're turning the rod a little bit too much. Yeah. Careful. Too much. A little bit more gently on it. Yes, there. I want to okay. do an extreme Just one, so it showed up on the screen. Yes, yeah, that's much better. Very beautiful. Coming very close to our Viking heritage. They obviously went over and did a lot of killing and pillaging, which wasn't so good. But it's it's fun to have a Viking link. Despite the reputation for rape and pillage, Eddie's maternal ancestry suggests Viking families came to Britain too, as part of a second wave of immigration. Maybe they got a boat right here. Maybe someone from my family got on a boat right here and went across and killed someone who was over there and said, can we steal your house? Yeah, anyway. So now I've got to go back to Britain to see where this leads. It would be so interesting to find some sort of link through the mum's side of the family coming in. Jim has been searching the database for matches to Eddie's next significant marker, which will bring him back to the UK. He's compared it to the DNA of 12,000 individuals who have submitted to a full exhaustive test of their motherline DNA. He found four matches, and he's arranged for Eddie to meet one of them. The match is so recent and so rare that it has yet to be given a name. You're going to meet two sisters, your nearest genetic cousins on your mother's side, and they're in Northamptonshire. You share an ancestor with them at some point in the last 500 to 1,000 years. Oh. So it shows that probably your ancestor came prior to that, which would fit in rather well with the Viking Age. So you're really very close genetically. Hello. Hi, I'm Jackie. Hello, Jackie. My name is Eddie. Hello. What's your name? Hi, I'm Jill. Hi, Jill. <laughs> Apparently we're related. Yes. Through genetics and stuff. That's pretty interesting. Um, do you, I, can I come into your house? Yes, yeah, sure, come here. here. <laughs> the sisters share a common maternal ancestor with Eddie. Yes. Possibly as few as 20 generations ago. We are 
ancestral cousins. Yeah, when you think in all these thousands of years, it's just amazing. Yeah. The point is we're quite close as relatives. Yeah. I thought we would be Anglo-Saxons, being right. blonde and blue-eyed. Right. But you didn't think Viking, blonde and blue-eyed? No, blue never Viking. No, I was excited when they said Viking. Yeah. But yeah. They, were, they were killers, though. They, they were, were actually Viking. terrible people, yeah. weren't they? I, I mean, know. they didn't care it's who three they years killed old, but everyone what they be killed. Viking. My mother died when I was a kid, you see, so it's interesting to suddenly have this all open oh, and have and the mother's line. This newly found link to his mum encourages Eddie to tell the sisters about the impact of her death. I'm this kind of emotionally cut down person, but you can, you can keep going, you can deal with things because you're used to just being on your own. But I always think, OK, well, something bad could happen after it. So you don't ever get surprised. So you never go crazy in case something goes the other way. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. Did you just say you've got children? I've got 47. No, I haven't got any. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no kids, but I'm going to get some from a shop. <laughs> well, you are funny. Well, on, on a good day. <laughs> thanks for thanks for doing this. Cheers. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. <laughs> we'll feed you if, if you like. Um, well, I think we'll be fine. I was looking into their faces to see if I could see myself. Not essentially, but they seem very young at heart and game and lively, so I identify with that. It's fascinating to meet people with whom I so recently share ancestry. In the lab, Jim has one final surprise for Eddie. He's been looking for matches to Eddie's most recent marker. It's actually incredible because we found that you had a marker in your DNA that no one else I've ever looked at carried. It probably means it happened rather recently. It's unique. Yes. <laughs> well, it tries to be special. I don't know, it makes you feel good, but it could just mean that you're an idiot. <laughs> and none of the people had the change that we saw in your DNA, so it was quite exciting. Wow. We're still working on this, Eddie. We don't know all the answers ourselves. Right. Um, unique sounds cool. I told you you were unique when I first met you. I believe that at some stage soon we will find a match to Eddie's unique motherline marker. We'll discover many more markers in his DNA and in our DNA. This is only the beginning of what the science can do. Five years ago, this groundbreaking journey would not have been possible. And we've all got these journeys, but to suddenly have it spelt out like that is amazing. I knew my mum for six years and then she, then she went and now I know these huge chunks of stuff about mum going all the way back to Africa through Turkey, getting all the way up to Denmark and her lineage probably came in a thousand years ago. And the Vikings would have landed in the seas of Britain, weather like this, and would have scared the bejesus out of everyone. But uh, maybe my mum was in the second wave. Maybe that we were accountant Vikings coming in saying, how many swords you got? So, to find out now about my father's life, that would be very interesting to put those two together, because I am interested in what goes to, together in me of my mother and my father, and to find out where he comes from. Next time, Eddie discovers how the male Izards battled with the Ice Age and slept with an alien species. You know, oh, sorry, sorry, mate. You can't get much more masculine than that. And good news, that's tomorrow night at 9 here on BBC One. And there's more good news from Russell Howard that's over on BBC Three right now.